question I want to begin our time together here <coughs> with is this. What do you do in danger or when, or when you don't feel safe? I'll tell you about an experience of mine. As many of you know, I drive out to Wisconsin quite frequently <laughs> and I commute back on the weekends. I come back typically Sunday evening. I drive back after dinner. Night has fallen. I'm coming into Chicago and try to get in at a decent time because I know it's wiser to do that than to come in really, you know, get in here real late. Well, some time ago, I came in and was driving back Sunday night and got, got into the city at about 9.30 at night. And I thought, hey, this is, this is fine. This is a good time. Started looking for parking around my uncle's, <laughs> uncle's place. I could not find any parking. I circled probably several times in desperation, I thought, oh, I'm going to go down here to the loop because I can always find parking right here at the little loop by the Chicago course. So I drove down here and I parked. And by this time, it was already, already half an hour had passed. It was 10 o'clock and I got, I got to thinking, is this, is this safe if I was going to walk home six blocks? And so... I asked Google, and I typed into Google, is it safe to walk home in <laughs> Chicago at 10 o'clock at night? And Google says, no, not safe. <laughs> so, what do I do in my danger? I think I'll call Jeremy. This is what I thought. I'm going to call Jeremy. And he'll let me sleep on his couch and I'll be safe tonight. <laughs> but, as Jeremy could testify, he did not receive a phone call. Nope. I got back in the car. I thought, okay, I'll take, I'll take one more loop. I go back around, back to my uncle's place. And I found a place God provided. <laughs> I had a spot <laughs> and I was able to walk in. Where do you turn when you don't feel safe? Where do you turn when you don't feel safe? You turn to people, to Google, to your own wisdom. I want to read a passage that turns us to God for our safety and our security. The title of my sermon is Untouchable. Untouchable. Read with me from Psalm 91. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. 
This psalm teaches that you and I, under the shadow of the Almighty, are safe. Is prudence good and wise? Of course. Check Google when you have to. <laughs> but ultimately, where is your security in this unsafe world that we live in? Under the shadow of the, Ma of the Almighty. That's, that's our safety. That's where we are safe. And I'm drawing that, that main idea right there from verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And at the start of the sermon, I'll tell you right now, the main application is right there in verse 2. What the psalmist says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. After the psalm, that's what I hope you do, and that's what I hope I do. Say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. We're going to look in verse 3 to 8 at what our safety is. What is our safety? Then in verse 9 to 13, how are we safe? And verse 14 through 16, can we be sure that we are safe? So what is our safety? Verse 3 to 8. Well, in a word, it's the deliverance. It's God's deliverance. That God delivers. He says, He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. What is this snare? What is this trap? of the fowler. Well, Hebrew parallelism, I, th I think it's just the next line. It's the deadly pestilence. What he's saying is, he's going to deliver you from sickness. He's going to deliver you from sickness. The sickness that might hunt you like a fowler. He will rescue you from that. What else? What else is our safety? In verse 5 and 6, he talks about this terror of the night that you don't have to fear. Again, what is this terror of the night? I think it's the same thing. You just look at the next line. Nor the arrow that flies by day. I think what that's speaking of is war. He will deliver you from violence and from war. I read of a woman <clears throat> serving in the Middle East and some country out there, uh, on, on a visit of hers there, she was told, well, this time, this time of the year, men are going to be shooting guns into the air. And sometimes the bullets drop and kill people. And so, with that comforting bit of knowledge, <laughs> that evening she went to bed and she heard gunshots going off and fear kind of seized her. And she was unscathed. But she, she, she referenced this, this truth as, as a comfort to her. That God, that she would not have to fear. No, not even this, the arrow by day, the bullets flying by day. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a wonderful quote I want to read to you from the preacher Robert Dabney that is related. After the Civil War, this is what Dabney said in thinking back at that time. He said, even when the thousand missiles of death, invisible to mortal sight and sent forth aimless by those who launched them, shoot in inexplicable confusion over the battlefield, his eye gives each one an aim and a purpose according to the plan of his wisdom. Thus teacheth our Savior, saying God's going to deliver you from the chaos of, of violence and war. Now hold, hold with me here. Stay with me. A thousand may fall, he goes on to say. Ten thousand might die, but it, you will not. But the question is, is, is that really true? Is that true? Because you all know, as I do, Christians get sick, Christians get injured in war, Christians die from sickness and plague. So is it true? 
Well, what I think this psalm wants us to do is redefine deliverance. To redefine deliverance. We need Paul's view. In 2 Timothy, he says to Timothy, you followed my persecutions and sufferings. That happened to me. In this place and that place. But from them all, the Lord delivered me. So he's saying the sufferings happened to him, but somehow the Lord delivered him. At the end of the letter, he says, the Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. I think this helps us in this psalm. We can say in truthfulness, he will deliver you from sickness. He will deliver you from violence and war. He will deliver you from death, whether now or later. Our souls are untouchable in passing through um, any of these things. Okay, you can say, thank you, Paul, that's helpful. What about Jesus? But Jesus says this in Luke 21. He says, some of you, speaking to his disciples, speaking to us, he says, some of you, they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your life. <clears throat> I think Jesus is saying the same thing. It seems, how can those two go together? He's saying, some of you will get sick. You will encounter violence or whatnot, but not a hair of your head is going to perish. He's saying, He's going to deliver you from these things. Your soul cannot be touched. You'll be delivered. Now you might ask, how? How will He do that? And that leads us into our next section. Verses 9 to 13. Let me tell you how my brother-in-law was kept safe. How he was kept safe on one occasion. My brother-in-law, he wanted to do a cool video, okay? He wanted to film a cool video of himself down by, uh, by a lake on a dock. And he had this idea, he wanted to film this video of himself holding flames in his hands, okay? <laughs> Stick with me. So, what, he did, what did he do? He, um, he bought like about 300 sparklers, and he wanted to bind them together, okay, and hold them. But he, he, he was thinking, how can I do this? He could figure out a way to bundle it together, so he thought, oh, I'll get a PVC pipe, and I'll shove it in a PVC pipe. <laughs> so he did this. He had these two bombs in his hands and they put the it's on video he put it on video and there he is at morning on the end of the dock just holding these PVC pipes posing in an epic fashion and one of them blows up in his hand <laughs> and then seconds later he drops the other one it hits the water and it blows up and the splash goes pretty high but thankfully, the other one was let go. Well, what he told me afterward was, what he told me afterward was, uh, in all sincerity, he said, you know, I don't remember dropping that other, that other uh, bomb, the other <laughs> piece of black work. Mm -hmm. And he said, I think an angel, I think an angel grabbed it. Now, my initial response to that is hesit hesitant. You don't know an angel. Grab that. You're being stupid. <laughs> but I don't know that it wasn't an angel. And we don't, you don't know either, right? We don't know. Definitively not. What we do know is what the scripture says in verse 11. He will command his angels concerning you. That's not talking about some missionary out in the boonies. Right. That's talking about you yeah. and talking about me. God will command his angels. They will guard you on their hands. They will bear you up. I'd love to hear 
stories from, from all of you of how God might have delivered you in your life. Hopefully not from doing such stupid things. <laughs> now, again, I want to stress, it's not primarily the physical danger that we are being sheltered from. There is greater danger than just the physical, and that's the spiritual danger. Questions like these. Will you pay, have to pay the debt of your trespasses in hell? Talk about danger. Or will Satan tear you apart, make you lose the, you know, fall away from the faith? Satan, who tempted Jesus with this very verse, verse 11, in the wilderness. Command, command the angels. Satan, what Satan omitted was the very next verse. Verse 13. An echo of that promise made long, long ago in the garden, he will bruise your head. This was spoken to Satan. You will bruise his heel. Here it is again, spoken again, picking that up. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. So how are we safe? Well, we're safe by the angels he commands to guard you. We're safe by that promise, but ultimately we're safe because our Lord Jesus did what this verse said he would do. He treaded on the lion and the adder. He trampled Satan underfoot. And he did it by going to the cross. And on that cross, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities. And he triumphed over them. And put them to shame. So, brothers and sisters, we are safe. You are safe in the shadow of Jesus Christ and His cross. We are safe. You won't have to pay the debt of sin forever in hell. Satan will not tear your soul to pieces because Jesus Christ crushed him and treaded on him on the cross. That's how we're safe. Still, even in light of that, you can ask, or you may ask, as I ask, can we be, can we be sure can we still be sure that, that that's the case, that we really are safe? Even in light of knowing what we know about what Jesus has done, can we be sure that our souls are safe? And I think that's what this final section here in the psalm addresses. The voice shifts from the psalmist to the, to the voice of God, speaking over his people. I want you to... I want you to listen to the voice of God spoken over you as addressed to you. Because you hold fast to Him in love. Wait, and what is this holding fast? I think it's nothing more than like what verse 2 of this psalm says, saying to God, you're my refuge. Just saying that to Him. You're my fortress. That's what it is to hold fast to Him. Because you hold fast to Him in love, he will, I will deliver you. I will protect you because you know my name. You know the Almighty. You know the Most High. You know ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. And the voice of God to you is this, I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue you. This is an amazing thing. I will honor you. I will show you my salvation.
Well, in closing, the word, the word to us is to trust him and to say to him, you are my refuge, you are my fortress, because you are safe in the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. Caleb, how are you uh, encouraged as you wrote this sermon? Oh, I'm encouraged for God giving me strength to preach two different sermons, and I haven't done that before. <laughs> I made it through the day. Yeah. I didn't die. Uh, I think it's a great encouragement to consider how God's safety, especially from your second point, is a supernatural kind of safety. Mm. So it goes beyond even like the dangers of this world, which mm -hmm. is so much greater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was encouraged in how you didn't keep safety just like a like something that we have, but it's like you, said, you made it clear that this was like for us specifically, mm -hmm. and this is for you, um, and not not just for those people over there, but for you mm -hmm. as well. So yeah, it was really encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how you uh, kind of brought the illustration of your brother-in-law in the concept of like angels helping and yeah. just remind me of a time when I was first saved that I was just saved from this almost accident there's no way, no other way to explain it but hmm. something supernatural happening and just reminding me just like hmm. you forget about those things as you grow older mm -hmm. like, oh yeah the Lord is still there mm -hmm. super powerfully and taking care of us so that's good hmm. Um, I was afraid of playing this song. This, this is one of my, my favorite songs. <laughs> and uh, I like how um, God doesn't let us down. <laughs> um, like, if we put our hope in Him, He's <laughs> not going to let us down. So I'm always super encouraged. <laughs> yeah, I think I was. Uh, most encouraged just by this idea that uh, safety is something we're looking for mm -hmm. and safety is found in God. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think you might have missed in this bad boy? I, I wrestled with the kind of going back to what we were talking about with division and distinction with the final section, I mean, the whole thing is really saying the same thing in different ways. So, I don't know, I guess I kind of taper off at the end, not sure of exactly how it was different, other than it was a shift to the perspective of God speaking to us. And so I went with it as like just reassurance, but I'm not sure if I quite caught that. Okay. <clears throat> I thought you did really well like with your first point it was really clear because you asked the question what is our safety and then you went into like you know the verses and the explanation but then when you like try to transition into the second point you gave us the, the, the numbers mm. but you didn't there was, right. there was a rough patch there mm. it took a little while to kind of catch on mm. yeah. huh. Um, I think in the beginning you framed this in a way that was like just true like we are or what did you say this is a passage that turns us to God which is true but I think it would have been more helpful if you framed this in a way of like and now I want to like show you why you should turn to God and how mm -hmm. this passage does it so then you're kind of like because there are people in your audience who might not believe this or mm -hmm. that, so then you're, it's you're showing that you want to convince them of that or show them why they should want it so, just being able to frame it all in that way, I think it'd be helpful. <coughs> Andre. Um, yeah, there was, I think it was before you got to the first main point, you had application, and you are talking about under the shadow of the Almighty, are, we are saved, and you did the application, at the end of the application, is like, it was just, like, how do we do this? It's my refuge and my, uh, uh, well, the rest of that verse, but it was like, okay, so I'm, I was just thinking, like, well, if I'm a new guy there, not really sure much about the Bible, so I might, I'm just thinking, so I just say those words in right. particular, or mm -hmm. like, it wasn't the concept of like trusting what those words meant. Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, I think uh, there were a lot of points in the sermon where I understood like what you were what you were doing and like the, the, what you were trying to do in moves wise were legitimate. But what you said like isn't isn't technically true and someone who like hasn't taken this course and doesn't understand like the moves you're making might misunderstand what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, give an example. So, um, like the psalm, so like you're, you you did this thing like, is it really true mm -hmm. that like the psalm, the psalm, like God's protecting you mm -hmm. from like evil, disease, and sickness and stuff like that? Well, you know that's not true. And that's a good move to make, with, like the concession, reputation stuff. But like your wording, it says, you said like the psalm wants us to like redefine safety. Mm -hmm. And then what you did from that is you went to Paul to yeah. redefine safety. Right. So that, 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 I think that like someone like listening to that, if I was hearing that and I didn't understand the moves you were making, mm -hmm. I'd be like, the psalm didn't do that, like Paul did it and you're taking mm -hmm. what Paul said and putting it into the right. psalm. Um, mm -hmm. And just like in general, I, I do think that like this distinction you're making between like physical and spiritual yep. is, isn't, you, you shouldn't do too much with with that right. in like preaching a psalm like this. Mm -hmm. But this does include mm -hmm. physical safety, right? Um, and you said like you might have to wait for it, but it it's it's a whole package safety. Mm. Yes, you bring up a good point because it's absolutely about physical safety, one hundred percent. So you problematize it, which is good. Your resolution to the problem uh -huh. is that's spiritual. <laughs> the resolution to the problem is not necessarily that it's spiritual. Like ultimate, so ultimately you could have gotten there uh -huh. for sure. Because in, in an ultimate sense, we have great confidence in this in a way that's much greater than the psalmist. Mm -hmm. But people still died in Israel. Right. The idea is this God. Is not promising that everybody's going to live forever and that no arrow will ever ever strike an Israelite. It's that the protection that the people have is the protection that comes from God. Hmm. I'm not following, I guess. So if arrows don't, in keeping with your angels bit, which is hilarious um, and super effective, in keeping with that, if danger does not come upon us, what we ought to understand is that's God protecting us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that in no instance ever will anybody ever suffer anything physical. It is that all the protection that God's people have comes from God. I guess I read this as more all-inclusive. I mean, it's so sweeping, these promises. It, well, in poetry. Yeah. Right. But even if it's all sweeping, uh -huh. you, you swept some of it under the rug. How so? You ditched the physical for spiritual. Right, because I think that's true. Oh, it might be true, but it's not what Psalms is saying. The psalmist is talking about physical protection. For sure. Hmm. So, a lot of what you're saying, so again, the spiritual part of it mm -hmm. amplifies us even more. Mm -hmm. Instead of Solves the problem because this isn't actually physical, mm -hmm. and that's the way it came across. Again, I'm with Theo. Like I know it moves your making, but the way that it's sounding is, it's not physical. I think I was kind of I was communicating that. Yeah. So that's maybe misunderstanding on my part. I mean, I thought mm. because it, as I read it, it is just so all sweeping. It's like this must be speaking about our souls, but maybe that's wrong. So. Yeah. But then, and so this is why I was confusing also, because you use physical examples. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So if you're going to go spiritual, you better go all in. Huh. So you would explain this as just any protection you get is protection from God. Yeah. Not you are always can be protected. Right. Okay. Victor. Um, yeah, I thought you had a 
like two gospel connections there, like one for each point, and it it kind of lost a little bit of the like impact of, of I don't know, like like the first one you went to like Paul and then to Jesus uh, to demonstrate that like it's a, like not even a hair on your head, right? Mm -hmm. But then the second one is like the the, the spiritual aspect of, of Christ's victory over evil that gives us that safety. Mm -hmm. mm. So, I don't know, I just, I just felt like it was, it, it wasn't like cohesive, like the way that it was, it was bringing both mm. things together or, or, or just elevating like Jesus in the sermon. It was like, this is how we understand it through Jesus, but I don't know if that's no, that does make sense. I, I think the part where I was trying to elevate it was the second part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely more so than the, the first part because the first is more like example. First part was really just to help me explain what I understood to be the spiritual protection we have. Yeah. Hmm. So where I thought you had some pretty good logical or just good transitions in this. I did feel like they kind of came at us a little quickly without like, it was like you are missing a few lines to get to what you were talking about to that transition, mm -hmm. just to make it more smoothly. Um, mm -hmm. Between really all of your points, you had a good question to ask mm -hmm. I mean, to move us along. But I think you just needed to do a little bit more work to reach that question mm -hmm. before you moved on. Can you give more, uh, or one example just to help me yeah, so point one, you're talking about the redefining deliverance and then just about how Jesus says uh, there will be suffering and then maybe a little bit more and then all of a sudden you said, how will he do this? Like talking about how will he hmm. um, be our safety or keep us safe? How are we to be safe? And I thought it was a good question to lead us in, hmm. but I just felt like it needed a little bit more information to smoothly get to that question. Okay. Just a couple of lines, right? Yeah. So like, what was the actual title of your second level of point? How are we safe? <clears throat> what was the title of your first point? What is our safety? What is our safety? Okay. So as simple as this. So that's our safety. Our safety is God. Whatever safety we've got, God is our safety. Okay? Now you summarize. Oh, oh just summarizing the point yeah. before going so on? Yeah. More. Summarize the point. Oh, okay. In a line or two. And then go, but of course, this raises a question. Gotcha. How is it? How does God do that? Bam, you're off and running to your next point. Yeah, I'd say that the only other place I got kind of confused was going in, I think it was in the second point, where it was like how God can do that, keep us safe. Mm -hmm. And then your answer was essentially angels and the cross. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is good stuff, but I, I think you could have probably developed that more and shown more how God is doing that. Because I'm just thinking again as a new guy and thinking, oh, I'm just it's angels in the cross. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, wait, show me. Or what, what are you saying I should have brought out? Uh, well, I mean, just like I guess it goes back to the the physical and then the soul thing. Well, okay, I guess he's not really protecting me. It's just all my souls are being protected. Was that was the finality of your argument? Felt like. Yep. Oh, so, I didn't yeah, want that. But Jesus, would Jesus say that? He's saying that like God's gonna protect my soul. He's saying I'm gonna chuck myself off here, and He's gonna protect my body. Uh huh. So wait. So what's your point? You kept going like, no, nah, not really though. <laughs> not really. It's all about soul. <laughs> <laughs> you know, angels supposedly saved your brother, which maybe not, who knows, but you're like, but angels, what angels do. So you said that physical, but then you kept flip-flopping. Uh, so you would just go all physical here? And then you don't have to go all physical, but you, I think it has to it's be It's lesser to greater, bro. Physical to the spiritual. Yep. Well, he'll see me eventually, eventually, but I don't know about my circumstances right now. He'll see me for that. So here's, my soul here's the thing. With the physical... I I'd want I'd want to hear someone explain that to me because that's very hard to explain it, that we're physically protected when you, so often we're not. You gave us more examples of physical. <laughs> because he does that sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Well, like even in that though, I feel that like his examples were showing kind of like leaning towards like the supernatural aspect. Sure. Of safety. 
where like even the fact that we're here right now perfectly fine right it's a it's a it's a way of God's preservation and safety upon right mm. you know our lives mm. everything all of the safety that God's people have so then when you're not physically delivered God didn't deliver you that's what you're saying uh, no, so you, I think that's what, that's the tension you play with until you pay off on life you are even delivered when you're physically not delivered Mm. Yeah. Uh. Even like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, the, like the salvation piece. Like, uh, like, like, when I see like it's spark. Mm-hmm. Like you know, like even like after you die, like you are still physically saved from death because like he gives you like yep. he mm-hmm. gives you a new body and he gives you like so like it, the, it, it's never simply just one like soul or body thing. He's God saving all of you. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Your whole, the whole thing. Yep. Um, but my last like like critique is is, is pretty like just simple. Um, I I don't think like you took into account if there would be an unbeliever in your audience. No, I was speaking to you guys. Yeah. So. Um, if, if you're preaching at church, and like you know like you shouldn't leave the unbeliever with mm-hmm. the assumption that they're gonna be. God is going to be protecting them. Yeah. Um, but like you, you can really like just like you can make a very. You already made this point. Like at the end of your sermon, like it's because you made God your refuge that you mm-hmm. know He's gonna like mm-hmm. He's gonna keep you safe. Mm-hmm. And then you just like you can direct that directly to the end believer. Like, have you made God your refuge? Yep. And mm-hmm. what does it mean to make God your refuge? Yep. And like so, so, let's take your second Timothy thing that you did. Yeah, which is a good place to go. Because here, here's you're right. This this sermon, you, you were cranking on all cylinders, even if you were off a little bit. You were cranking until you got to your third point, and the whole thing died. Mm-hmm. It's like, and we're done. It's like, whoa, geez, where'd that come from? <laughs> if you would have held back the second Timothy stuff, uh-huh. the second Timothy stuff gets you. There's a physical part, but then there's the irony of like he will. Look, well, how does he know that? Because he's confident in like whatever happens to him, life, death. How is that? Then you roll back to the second point and talk about the whole crushing the serpent and everything like that. You bring that up like in the third point. Oh. What God says he's going to do. Well, how, how is he going to do that? Right? He says he's going to do it. That's the confidence that we have that he's going to do it. And you and I have even more confidence. You go like that. Because since you brought it in early, and here's just homiletically why it was problematic, you asked a question. You, thankfully, you did something. You tried to do a transition, but your transition—it even felt like you felt like it was kind of like this is lame, because you were like, well, "How can we be sure?" It's like, bro, you already talked about Jesus' death and resurrection. Like, what else are you gonna add to that? And so when you got your third point, it's like, ah, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Right? So even homiletically, you kind of shot yourself in the foot because you 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 kind of sold it too early. Because it was great. It, that's. How you know you could you if you unleash it at the third point um, and then step it up from the physical to the spiritual and using Paul as an example of comp- comp- being like man nobody can do nothing to me mm-hmm. great uh, what did you think you made progress on ah uh, I'm just trying to you know. Put some more stories in there to yeah. help. Yep. Yep. Oh, this is the no. best service by like a mile and a half. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, man, like it was very engaging. Uh, like just, there were stories that were hilarious. They were just drawing you in. Like if maybe there were points where you might have felt a little lost, like your transitions or your points or whatever. Mm. But then your, your stories just pulled us right back in. They were great. Yeah, I saw Caleb up there and heard Caleb up there, and it was just really refreshing to see you finally coming out. And yeah, I just saw it. Like, you were getting into the stories and you were mm-hmm. enjoying them, and it really felt like it was a good, good thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, this was your best preaching so far, for sure. Like, you just felt, you seemed like you were comfortable up there, mm-hmm. you were excited about what you were preaching, and it just really worked. And yeah, you did have a lot more stories, and it worked, and it was enjoyable to listen to. Um, 
I'm, I'm kind of stunned. You know, I felt like I went to bed, and then I woke up. Right. And what happened? Just like on like one thing, like how you like, you, you did this twice with your illustrations. You like picked a word or something from like, uh, or you you tied your uh, introduction of like, like I looked up Google for safety. Mm. Uh, and stuff like that. You tie that back into like your your like sermons. Mm -hmm. like, where do you look for safety? Sometimes you do this. I yeah. look at Google, and, mm -hmm. and then like your angel piece, like that was that was really funny. And then you tied it back to the right. text and transition back mm -hmm. into like the verse. Mm -hmm. And like, but he says he does do this sometimes, like mm -hmm. right here in verse eleven, and mm -hmm. throws right back into the text and like. So that move right there was like huge improvement. Yep. Not only just illustrations, but like tying it back into the text. Yep. So great, great work. Thanks. Yeah, so you didn't use it real well, but your homiletical outline, mm. like again, miles of improvement. Because the second you said it, I was like, that makes sense. Uh huh. All three of those things work together without you having to explain everything in the text in order for them to make sense. Mm -hmm. So now, next time, like same kind of deal, and just use it more effectively for your purposes, rhetorically, because we're not gonna just write it down and naturally get it. Mm. But as you kind of had read the text, told us what your main point was, your homiletical points worked with your main point to be like, uh -huh. solid, totally work, makes sense. Um. Yeah, I thought your main point was uh, clear and simple, mm -hmm. just from like the way you presented it to the way you carried out through. So that when you got to like your conclusion statement, it was like, yeah, of course, like, mm -hmm. duh. <laughs> it was just like so mm. clearly and well carried. It's gone. Yeah, and I think maybe it's because of the structure of your s sermon, but it felt like you you spent time in this, like understanding how these parts flow together, and maybe the last point could have been thought about a little bit more, but mm -hmm. I was like following you, and when you went to these different ideas, it was just easier, and it felt like you had one long mm -hmm. flow that worked. And I just, yeah, I was following you the whole time. So the same thing, the structure, simplicity of it, easy for people to follow along, and explain it rightly, so it's good. Um, I, I, when you started your sermon, it was like, what is our safety? And then you started like explaining like, what is like the fowler and the pestilence mm -hmm. and stuff mm. like that. And you, you were using like, it's sickness. God is going to save you from sickness. God is going to deliver you from war. I was like, you're so dead. <laughs> um, because like, obviously that's like not true. Mm -hmm. Um, like obviously like Christians get sick and like die mm -hmm. in wars and stuff like that. But like you raised it and like you made such blunt statements and then went, but is this really true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just like that that move to like anticipate like I'm gonna think that and uh, mm -hmm. try to like respond to that question is like it's it's a pro move and I thought yeah. like, yep, that's that's like that's the right mm -hmm. again, like some of your execution is some of like how you said it, like it needs to be tightened up, but like the moves you are making mm -hmm. in the sermon are the right moves mm -hmm. to make. Mm -hmm. Right, for sure. Yeah, that, that was my last one, but about the angels, right? See, it was a really funny story about your brother being done with fireworks. <laughs> and then he's like, well, an angel did it. And you're like, dude, we don't, I, don't know, I don't know that. <laughs> and then, so think about the unbeliever. You're like, that sounds crazy, by the way. Mm -hmm. right? My brother sounds like a crazy person. Well, here's what this text is saying. Mm -hmm. This text says something crazy. He says... And while I can't be sure of that in my brother's case, the psalmist says that's exactly what angels do. Mm -hmm. I I admit, like that sounds bizarre. Mm -hmm. But this is what I do know: that God has servants who guard His people, mm -hmm. right? But that whole move, the, the way you yeah. moved that whole way through, it was like oh, okay, because you didn't pretend like that story was normal. Mm -hmm. and it was funny, and it was not just because like humor s serves everything. But you're like naturally kind of a funny person. And it was the first time I was like, oh, you're not forcing a joke or whatever. You're just like telling this thing. Mm -hmm. And the way you played it off and your timing of it, 
it landed so helpfully. Like, I don't know that, but I do know that this is what this Texas San Angels do. Like, oh, here we go. Mm. It's great. It's great. Keep Thanks, doing guys. That.